So uh, I grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago, and I went to the University of Illinois, and uh, I remember uh, walking into the university basically thinking that there were four or five career paths. Uh, you could be an accountant, you could be a lawyer, you could be an engineer, you could be a doctor. And when I got to university, I was like, oh, there are people who actually make their living by being a professor, right? And then actually my world expanded from there. I met nonprofit leaders and thought to myself, man, you can like have a big idea and build it into a civil society organization and actually take a salary from that, right? And so part of what I hope today is about for students who might think, hey, there's five or six career paths available to me. Uh, you know, meeting Amanda Tyler, that's a job. What Amanda does in leading an advocacy organization that is deeply rooted in the Baptist faith and having a staff and working on Supreme Court cases and doing education programs, it's a career path. Uh, what I do in building IFYC as an organization that works on college campuses to promote interfaith leaders is a career path. And actually, I think in the future, being an interfaith leader itself is gonna be its own kind of career path. So part of what I hope this does for you is not to just open you up to a part of the world that may be new, but also to say, I can be a leader in that part of the world. I can, I can carve my own path in that part of the world. I can actually take it further into the next chapter, places that folks like Ibu and Amanda and Jamie haven't seen yet, right? That's why it's exciting for me to be on a college campus because I am looking at people who are gonna be writing chapters that I can't even dream of in the American story. So I wanna uh, take you for a second to my city of Chicago to uh, a scene and a conversation I had a couple years ago. Um, so I was invited by the president of the Chicago Food Depository to come do a tour of the facility. I bet you there's a Dallas or a DFW food depository. In some ways, they're some of the most inspiring places in the country, right? It's, it's a, a civil society endeavor. Uh, it's, it's typically not a government endeavor. It's an endeavor of, of just people who participate in the society, uh, uh, who come together and say, we're gonna organize ways to feed people who go hungry. In some ways, it's of course, like very sad that in the richest society in human civilization, people still go hungry. But, but nonetheless, here I am at the Chicago Food Depository and I'm getting this tour of what's a gargantuan facility. Uh, you know, it's like a football field size and it's like, you know, it's many floors uh, and it's like packed to the gills with food of all types that are gonna be going to distribution centers in the six million some Chicago area to help feed the hundreds of thousands of, of hungry folks. So after, you know, about 45 minutes of walking around with the president and the, and the senior VP, I stopped and I said, you know, you guys are busy people. Why, why are you taking this time with me? And they said, well, we recently did an audit of all of the, the human resources involved uh, at the Chicago Food Depository. And we discovered that of the 650 distribution centers, right, of course not every hungry family comes to the main site to get their, their bags of groceries. Uh, these are distributed at, at 650 sites around the, around the Chicagoland area. Of those 650, almost 500 are part of faith communities. It's not all Protestant churches, it's also Catholic churches. It's not all churches, it's also synagogues. It's mosques, it's temples, it's secular humanist societies. But there is no way we could do our work unless there were faith and philosophical communities who are willing to serve as distribution sites. And of our volunteer base, the people who come in here and package the food in uh, you know, bags and in boxes to send out to these distribution sites, two thirds of those people are part of faith communities. And there's actually a really interesting visual of this. Uh, these, these two leaders are telling me, you can stand up here on this like third floor looking down at this huge football field of food. You can stand up here on a Sunday afternoon at three o'clock and you can literally watch eight different groups come in for their 90 minute volunteer shift starting at three o'clock on a Sunday. And they, ver they, they have the, the, the exact same format. They're all wearing some kind of a shirt that kind of ties them to a faith community. The, you know, the shirts that you see, that some of you have probably worn, or you see on kids who are off to a mission trip at the airport, right? Uh, you know, the Church of St. Patrick, the, uh, uh, the, the Muslim Community Center, et cetera, like eight groups like this. They start with a prayer, a reading of scripture, they volunteer for about 60 minutes, and they have 20 minutes of discussion at the end, connecting their faith commitment to those, 
to that activity. And then you can watch them all file out. And the extent of the relationship they have with, you, with each other is something like, it's not even verbal, it's like a, a what's up, right? <laughs> so the Catholics are like doing this to the Muslims, the Muslims are doing this to the Jews, like we know you're here, we know how you did your thing, we did it the exact same way. But there's not much of a relationship beyond that. And it got these two people who run the food depository to thinking that the most effective advocacy day that they do is church day in Springfield. And the Jews are talking about doing a synagogue day. And they thought to themselves, what if we did an interfaith day? Springfield is the state capital. It's where there's a big lobbying effort every year. And the most effective public service announcements they have on radio stations are when uh, religious leaders are speaking. What if they had an interfaith version? A rabbi, an imam, a Buddhist priest, a Christian pastor doing it together. And then they started thinking to themselves, man, are we entering into a rabbit hole? We don't, we don't know how deep this goes and how complicated it can get. What if we do an interfaith day in Springfield and on the way down, the Jews, Christians, and Muslims start to argue about the Middle East or about abortion? Totally, totally plausible, right? What if the argument gets so bad that they decide that they're not gonna lobby together for homelessness and hunger concerns, right? That the, the disagreement that they have tripped across is so central that they're not gonna work together on the, on the agreement that they previously had, right? What if we tried to create uh, interfaith volunteer projects and get the mosque youth group, the synagogue youth group, and the church youth group to volunteer together on a Sunday afternoon, and they have a theological argument. What if the, the Muslim imam says, we should all pray, and he begins a prayer in Arabic, or the Christian preacher says, we should all pray, and does a prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, and people are like, we don't, we don't actually do that. And those groups decide they're not going to volunteer again. Too risky, we shouldn't do it. And then they said, well, that's why we brought you here. We're wondering if you know somebody, this actually happened, believe it or not, you know somebody, a recent college graduate who we could hire to be our interfaith coordinator, who would show us how to do this, who would lead a pilot of an interfaith volunteer project between different faith-based youth groups on Sunday afternoons, who would help to script an interfaith PSA. So here's my question, totally serious question. Could you apply for that job? I mean, you're gonna graduate from SMU, inshallah, God willing, right? You're clearly in a religion class at SMU. You've got the Perkins School of Theology right down the way. Could you do that? Would you be interested? So a lot of our civil society looks like this. If you work for the city of Dallas or Fort Worth, or you work for the Red Cross and a tornado comes through here and you're responsible for the relief effort afterwards, outside of government-based resources, your largest resource is gonna be diverse faith communities. And you're gonna to have to figure out, you know, what the Muslims and the Jews and the Buddhists and the Sikhs and the Hindus and the Christians, they're literally all going to be calling you saying, we are organized to help. And you're gonna to have to figure out what that looks like. How do you get these groups to work together? If all of them decide we're gonna pack meals for the relief and none of them are willing to open up as a homeless shelter, that's not good, right? If you don't feel comfortable talking to Muslims, you can't figure out how to get them involved in a relief effort. A lot of American civil society, the people who run food deposit, who volunteer at food depositories, including the people who run them, the people who are involved in disaster relief efforts, the people who run and volunteer for social services across the board are largely people from diverse faith communities. Are we gonna have a society in which they volunteer side by side with the occasional head nod? It's a whole lot better than hot conflict, right? I mean, I would take this over, you know, uh, 
over hot conflict any day, but it's not interfaith cooperation. It seems like we're leaving some things on the table, right? You're not really building understanding. You're not expanding common ground. You're not in kind of geeky parlance. You're not uh, uh, strengthening social capital, which is to say, like, if when Muslims and Jews and Catholics and, and Baha'is work together, the sum is greater than the parts. You're doing other good things for the society. Opening story. So how do we get here? How do we get to the most religiously diverse nation in human history, most religiously devout nation in the Western Hemisphere? How do we get here? You want me to tell you a dumb interfaith joke? It is mid-afternoon. All right, ready for this? Um, two, uh, two guys meeting at a cafe in California. It's supposed to be a bar, but I'm a Muslim. We don't do bars. Cafe in California. And one says to the other, this guy's like eating lentils and he's got long hair. He says, uh, do you know anything about Eastern religions? The other says, yeah, I knew some Methodists when I lived in Pennsylvania. <laughs> get it? Yes, thank you very much. Can I get a smile from at least one undergrad? <laughs> Come on. This is why my 12 year old's like, okay, boomer. <laughs> uh, so, not a funny joke, I get it, but it's an interesting window. I mean, nobody thinks Methodists from Pennsylvania are Eastern religions, right? So there's about six million Methodists in America. It's about six million Jews in America. If there aren't six million Muslims, there will be soon. Probably four to five million Muslims. Anybody know uh, what church our founding fathers went to when they went to church, which wasn't actually super often? Uh, um, uh, recognize the importance of religion. Most of them were not especially uh, ritualistic people necessarily. Anybody know the church? Mm, that's maybe one, but the other, the one I'm thinking about, where do they all come from? Yeah, they were, they, when George Washington went to church, tended to go to Anglican Church or Church of England, Episcopal Church. So anybody want to guess how many Episcopalians there are in the United States? Undergrad, you want to venture a guess? How many Episcopalians? The church that our, many of our founding fathers, when they went to church at all, went to. How many Episcopalians are there in the United States? Three. What? Less than three million. 2.2 million and not growing. So just think about this for a second, okay? There are three times the number of Jews in America than there are Episcopalians. There are close to three times the number of Muslims in America than there are Episcopalians. There are four to five million Buddhists in America, two to three times the number of Episcopalians. America is changing fast, right? Muslims, the youngest faith group in America. You know, median age is in the 30s. Okay, I promise you the median age of Presbyterians is not in the 30s, <laughs> okay? So the Chicago Food Depository, the disaster relief effort with diverse religious communities, that's the future, right? The Chicago folks might be the first ones saying, I wanna hire a recent college grad as, uh, as an interfaith coordinator. They are not gonna be the last ones saying that. Our civil society is made up of diverse religious communities volunteering, participating, doing disaster relief efforts, doing food relief efforts. Do you have the knowledge, the skills, the vision, the kind of right touch to be able to organize them? How do we get here as America? We get here because religious freedom is a foundational principle. Right, which is the work that Amanda talked about. Uh, it's the work of the of the BJC, the formerly the Baptist Joint Committee, and it is a foundational principle. So, I actually want to just spend a minute walking through a couple of very very old documents about the centrality of religious freedom. So, it's Roger Williams. Uh, uh, some people like to call him the first Baptist. Uh, uh, started a Baptist church begins as a Puritan minister, 
Amanda likes to refer to him as a spiritual seeker, given the his the range of his interest in in religion. He did a cosmology of local Native American tribes in the Northeast area. Uh, this is one of the things he says in 1644. And I ask whether or no such as may hold forth other worships or religions. Jews, Turks, or anti-Christians, may they not be peaceable and quiet subjects, loving and helpful neighbors, fair and just dealers, true and loyal to the civil government. It is clear they may from all reason and experience in many flourishing cities and kingdoms of the world. I'm just gonna say this again. This is a European settler on this patch of land in 1644, at a time where virtually nowhere else on the planet was it, it's certainly not in Europe, was a society organized around the ability to have a religiously diverse democracy, right? Which is to say a place where different religious communities get to participate in public and political life. There might have been other religiously diverse societies, they were dictatorships, which is to say the dictator or the government squelched religious expression. Roger Williams in 1644 is saying something very different and it's, he's not the only one. So amongst the most famous documents along these lines, 1657, about a decade later, the flushing remonstrance, this emerges when the governor general of New Amsterdam, now New York City, right? Dutch New Amsterdam bans Quaker prayer meetings. This is the most common thing in the world back then. You can't pray the way that you you can't pray in that way. We will not allow you to be a part of that faith community. He bans Quaker prayer meetings. A group of people gather in Flushing, what is now Flushing, Queens. None of them are Quaker. And they draft what comes to be known as the Flushing Remonstrance. I'm gonna read you two paragraphs. Here's the first. The law of love, peace, and liberty in the states extending to Jews, Turks, and Egyptians as they are all considered sons of Adam. Our desire is not to offend any one of his little ones in whatsoever form, name, or title he appears in, whether Presbyterian, Independent, Baptist, or Quaker, but shall be glad to see anything of God in any of them. Note the spiritual threads through all of this, desiring to do unto all men as we desire all men should do unto us, which is the true law both of church and state for our Savior say it, this is the law and the prophets, right? Mid 17th century, a set of European settlers on this patch of land are imagining a religiously diverse democracy. The formal American founders, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, Franklin, are influenced by these writings and also the writings of, of Enlightenment philosophes like John Locke. And they articulate the, f the framework for, the f for religious freedom in a diverse democracy. So Madison famously says, uh, uh, borrowing from Voltaire, if there is one religion in the United States, it will do what one religion always does, it will dominate everybody else. If there are two religions, they will do what two religions always do, they'll kill each other. If there are 30 religions, they will have to learn how to get along, right? So that's James Madison. Washington, when he is approached by uh, the leader of a Jewish community, a man named Moses Sessius, and Sessius congratulates him on becoming the first president, and congratulates him on the passing of the Constitution, the ratification of the Constitution, and then says, what's gonna happen to my people in this new nation? You know, we Jews who've been hated and hounded uh, um, and harassed in Europe for centuries, what's gonna happen to us in this new nation? And Washington writes back, my government will give to bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance. May the children of the stock of Abraham sit in safety under their own vine and fig and let there be none to make them afraid. Right? The first iftar, you all know what an iftar is? An iftar is the meal that ends the daily fast during the month of Ramadan. So during the month of Ramadan, Muslims fast. It's super hardcore uh, from uh, um, dawn to dusk, right? So like, Ramadan starts in like six weeks and the Muslims who fast will fast from like 4.30 a.m. to like 7.30 p.m., no food or water. And Presidents Trump, Bush, Obama, and Clinton all hosted iftars. Iftar is the ceremonial meal that ends the fast. They all hosted iftars in the White House. They weren't the first. You know who the first was? Thomas Jefferson, 1803. Think about this. 
a U.S. president in 1803, third president, the drafter of the Declaration of Independence, hosts an iftar in the White House, right? These are all statements of both religious freedom. You are allowed to worship the way that you want to worship and a recognition that it welcomes religious diversity. It sounds like a really obvious thing to say, but it, it requires being underscored. Religious freedom is an abstract idea that leads to a very concrete reality. Lots of different religions flourishing in a single political entity. Never before in human history, in a democracy, which is to say a society in which people participate in political and public life, was it ever thought possible that you could have religious diversity? In fact, Michael Walzer is this beautiful line, the political philosopher Michael Walzer has this beautiful line uh, in his book, What It Means to Be an American, that for centuries political philosophers believed that one religious communion made one nation. You had to be the same religion to become a nation. Otherwise, it, it wasn't gonna work. And he writes this whole kind of paper on this, and then he ends the paper of like all the reasons that you had to be a single religious communion to be a nation. He ends that, and he starts in the next section, and it begins with, until the United States of America. It's kind of a crazy thing to read, because he's like, here's all the reasons America is impossible. Oh, and then America exists. And it starts the idea that people who believe very different things, how and why we're created, who, and who gets to heaven and how they get to heaven, very different things could live together, right? And that's where we get the America that we have now. And by the way, this nation is not getting any less religiously diverse. It's not getting any less religiously diverse. You're not gonna have more Episcopalians volunteering at the Dallas Fourth Word Food Depository in 30 years, you're gonna have more Baha'is, Buddhists, Jains, Hindus, and Muslims volunteering there, right? So what does it look like to be the kind of leader who can encourage cooperation between people from different religious communities? What does it look like to be the kind of leader who gets the job at the Chicago Food Depository? Let me tell you the story of my friend Abu Bakr Khan. By the way, I'm going to go for about 10, 12 more minutes, and then we'll take questions, just to let you know where I'm going. Um, so my friend Abu Bakr Khan uh, grew, grows up back and forth between Canada and uh, the United States. He's from kind of a vaunted Indian Muslim family. His, his family actually protected one of the Sikh gurus uh, in India uh, um, when the Sikh guru was being run out of his village. Uh, uh, so as kind of a part of their Muslim honor, this is his ancestral family protects this, this man. It's a very powerful story. Um, in any case, uh, he's part of this, kind of peripherally a part of this mosque community. He's in his early 20s. He's not much older than, than many of you, many of the undergrads in this room. He's peripherally a part of this mosque community who's, that his uncle happened to start in Vancouver. And during the coldest winter in a generation in Vancouver, this is December 2016, he winds up at a meeting at City Hall. The mayor has called this meeting uh, because there's been so many people dying from the cold in Vancouver, so many homeless people, street people dying from the cold that the city's resources are just tapped out. And they've reached out to diverse faith leaders to gather them at City Hall to say, what do we do, right? Uh, George and Nancy just gave each other a look. And the reason they did, so there are two important faith leaders, that they, they lead something called Faith Forward here in Dallas. And the reason they gave each other a look is because of course, they get that call all the time, right? When the city's social services resources are tapped out, who does a city turn to? The people who run the faith communities not just for blessings and prayers, but because they have major social capital, buildings, volunteers, kitchens. They do things for the society, okay? So Abu Bakr Khan, like I said, he's 23, 24 years old. He's not, you know, the, the mosque's first choice to send to a meeting with the mayor of Vancouver. But 
the chair of the social action committee can't go and the number two can't go. And so they're like, maybe Abu Bakr is free on this random Tuesday night. Turns out that he is. He winds up at this meeting. He's like the youngest person there by 30 or 40 years, right? I want to remind you, he's not that much older than most of the undergrads in this room. And he's not like a super ritualistic cat, okay? He's peripherally involved in this moss community. Mostly he's just like a 23-year-old cat dude, right? Like his uncle starts this mosque. Islam is important to him. Probably not a top five thing, okay? But when he gets a call from the chair of the board of the mosque, he goes. Imagine some of you are like this, right? Maybe you don't make it to church, synagogue, or whatever every Sunday or every Saturday, but you're peripherally involved. It's important to you. You get a call from the chair of the board to represent the church, you're going to go. So he winds up there, and um, the person who runs this, the city morgue opens up with this line. The morgue is full. We can't take any more bodies. So many people have died on the streets of Vancouver. Um, we, we literally can't take any more bodies, and we don't know what to do. Right? Like we got homeless, we, like we've opened all our emergency homeless shelters. We've tapped out all the funds. We've done all the meals on wheels we can do. Like we're, we don't know what to do. And the way Abu Bakr tells the story, which I'm sure is a little bit of Abu Bakr bias, right? But the way he tells the story is like these kind of the good and great faith leaders of the city stand up and they like, you know, uh, talk about all of the great stuff that their church or their synagogue, Nancy's laughing because she can totally see this, right? All the good stuff that their church or synagogue or whatever is doing, right? We're doing da 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 And Abu Bakr, you know, he's thinking to himself, are you people not listening? Did you not? I mean, it's not enough. Thank you for like doing 10% more, but what these people are saying is it's not enough. And so... Abu Bakr gets up and he's like, we're going to open the mosque as a homeless shelter. Everybody turns to him. They're all like 60 with like a bunch of letters after their name, you know, a bunch of honorary whatnots. He's like 23. They've never seen him before. They know the chair of the board of the mosque. They know the mosque has never been opened as a homeless shelter. Here's this 23-year-old kid like committing the mosque as a homeless shelter. Mayor's like, well, thank you. What's your name again? <laughs> You're the one person I don't recognize here, right? And so begins what I think is a remarkable story. Right? Now Abu Bakr has kind of put this thing out there, right? He's told this story and he's got to make it real. So he goes back and he has a conversation with the board of the mosque. And he says, I committed to the mayor of Vancouver that we're going to open the mosque as a homeless shelter. And the mayor's question was, how many people can you take? And I guessed 50. <laughs> so we will be opening the mosque as a homeless shelter next week and we'll be taking 50 people. And the board of the mosque starts to argue with him. Like, first of all, you have no right to do this. You have no jurisdiction, right? You have no, you know, and by the way, this is our mosque. And what's interesting is it touches something off in Abu Bakr. It basically touches off his Muslim Sunday schooling. And he says, it's not our mosque. Every mosque is God's house. Didn't you teach me that, by the way? Right? And he starts to kind of remember these Quran verses that he's been taught since he was five or six, that these people taught him things like, God sent the prophet Muhammad to be nothing but Ramatul Alameen, a special mercy upon the world, doesn't our city need us to be a special mercy upon all the worlds right now, that uh, um, the prophet was known as Alameen, the reliable, don't we need to be relied on right now? He's arguing theology with the mosque board, right? And honestly, he's winning. He's winning because every single one of our religious traditions says if you have the choice between being less generous and more generous, become more generous, right? And he, that kind of flood of material is coming back to him. So the folks say, okay, here's the deal. You can do this, but it has to be staffed at all times, right? You have to have volunteers here at all times, whenever outsiders are here, right? So let me ask you a question. 
are all of your, to, mostly for the undergrads in the room, uh, are all of your friends part of your church? You got friends from other religions, right? Well, same with Abu Bakr. So something that the mosque board didn't really realize that they were doing, but just kind of came with the territories. If you're going to say Abu Bakr, you got to staff the mosque. You got to have volunteers here who you personally know. They're imagining in their minds a bunch of Muslims from the mosque. But Abu Bakr's friends are people from all different religious backgrounds. So here he shows up with his friends who are black Christians and South, South Asian Sikhs, Sikhs and East Asian Buddhists. And they're like, well, we're doing the overnight shift at the mosque. And he, the mosque boards kind of look at each other like, I mean, I guess, right? <laughs> so Abu Bakr begins to understand like, wait a second, I'm at, like, there's a powerful thing that's happening here because he's had to talk to all of his friends in their religious frame of reference. He taught to talk to the mosque board in Islamic theology. He had to talk to his Christian and Buddhist and Jain and Hindu friends in their religious frame of reference, right? It wasn't their, wasn't their Friday night plan to do an overnight shift at the mosque volunteering with homeless folks. So why do you do that? Because you're a Christian. Well, I haven't been to church for two years. Yeah, well, sometimes there are things that are more important. Like showing up here at this mosque where you express a part of a Sermon on the Mount Christianity, right? Well, I haven't been to synagogue for a while. Yeah, but, but Abu Bakr heard of this thing in Judaism called Tikkun Olam, repairing the world. Right? And, and it's funny, like he had a Jewish friend when he was 13 or 14, but it had come back to him. So he's explaining this to his Jewish friend. And he, that guy's like, yeah, you know, you're right. This is a good way to do this. I've been wanting to do something. You're giving me the opportunity, and it's more powerful that it's connected to my faith identity, even if I haven't been to synagogue for a couple of years. Problem. They all go to work at 7.30 in the morning, Right? Young professional types. This is you in four or five years. Well, it's still cold in Vancouver at 7.30 in the morning. So what do you do? So Abu Bakr realizes that even though the mosque is not professionally staffed, meaning nobody shows up at nine in the morning to kind of do their day shift, a lot of churches are. A lot of Protestant churches and Catholic churches have daytime professional staffs. Okay, so what if we figure out a way to get the folks from the makeshift homeless shelter at the mosque to these local churches? They start to make phone calls. They now have to articulate the reason for this in the frame of reference of those religious leaders. A couple of churches say, we'll take them, but we can't provide food. Well, a lot of synagogues are not staffed nine to five daily, but many of them have kitchens. Okay. Let's go talk to the synagogues and see if they will put together food and bring, them, bring it on a daily basis to these churches. Abu Bakr Khan builds this interfaith network. By the way, he wasn't a religious studies major. He just lived in a religiously diverse milieu, otherwise known as 21st century North America, and he paid attention to the religious identity of his friends. And he paid attention to the traditions and communities they were connected to, even if those connections were not especially active, right? He knew that the idea of repairing the world was important to his Jewish friend, even if that Jewish friend wasn't especially religiously active in a ritualistic way at that time. So here's my question. Is this you? If you're at that meeting in Vancouver, do you stand up and say, I'm gonna commit my church to being a homeless shelter? Would you have the theological chops to talk to the church board into, this isn't our house, this is house belongs to God and we submit it to God's mercy? Would you be able to put together a group of religiously diverse friends to staff that homeless shelter overnight? 
How would you talk to your Muslim and Jain and Hindu friends about why this is important to them? How would you activate in them what might be a latent connection to religion, one that's based on service and social action, even if it doesn't express itself principally in adherence to doctrine or ritual at that time in their lives? Do you know enough about religious sociology to say those churches are staffed during the day, those people have a kitchen, I feel confident enough to go have that conversation. Here's my wild guess. My wild guess is you're a lot more like Abu Bakr Khan than you think. And you know what that means? That means you could apply for that job at the Chicago Food Depository. If you grew up in 21st century North America, you probably have friends from different religions. You probably have picked up more about their religion than you know. If push came to shove, you would probably be able to talk to them within their own religious framework about why this kind of interfaith cooperation project that literally saves lives, literally saves lives, is important to them. As a Jew, as a Muslim, even if you didn't have content knowledge, you would say something like, you know what, in, in, in Matthew 25, this is what the Bible says about Jesus. I would imagine that there's something like that in the Quran about the Prophet Muhammad, and I wanna learn. I don't have content knowledge, but I have a framework of the importance of social action and cooperation across religious traditions. I'm gonna share with you a little bit from my background. I'm interested in inviting you into a conversation in this way about your background, right? In other words, your practical knowledge about religious diversity probably supersedes your theoretical knowledge. That's why you're in college. What would it look like to bring those things into alignment with each other, right? What would it look like to hang out at the Baptist house at the Perkins School of Theology and lean into learning in a more formal way about religious sociology? How are different faith community set up? What's the difference between uh, uh, a Sunni mosque and an Ismaili Jamaat Khanna? How do those places operate? What does social action in different religious traditions look like? Right? What does it mean to lean into that, to bring your theoretical knowledge, your kind of confidence in the ability to cite chapter and verse? What does it look like to bring that up to the same par as I am confident that your practical knowledge is already at? What does it look like to be able to put on your resume, I'm an interfaith leader, that's part of what I do. Part of what I do is I organize positive cooperation projects with people from different religions. I don't expect doctrinal agreement. I know that there are people who are on different sides of the abortion debate in, in my group. We focus on feeding people. We focus on making sure people don't freeze to death when there's a, a, a cold snap. That's what we do. We work on the areas where we can work on together and we learn more about each other in that way. So I actually wanna end with a, a, a different kind of Baptist. Um, so towards the beginning, I talked about Roger Williams, but I'll tell you the, I think the most important interfaith leader in American history was. That's Martin Luther King Jr., right? So. We know King as a paragon of nonviolence, a civil rights hero, an African-American hero. He is all these things. And King is also a Baptist minister, right? One of my favorite lines by King is, many people want to make of me many things, but in the deep recesses of my heart, I'm a Baptist minister. I'm the son of a Baptist minister. I'm the grandson of a Baptist minister. I'm the great-grandson of a Baptist minister. And my devotion, my commitment to Jesus as the son of the living God is the highest commitment that I have. It's higher than race or nation or creed, right? Like, let us be clear on how King understands himself. He understands himself as a black man, understands himself as, a, as an American, but above all, he understands himself as a Baptist minister. I think that is really important. And who outside of Jesus of Nazareth most shapes the way King acts in the world? It's a Hindu from India. It's Mahatma Gandhi. King says it himself in his autobiography. 
right? That second to Jesus and Montgomery and all through the civil rights movement, it is the mode and method of Gandhi that guides his actions. In fact, it is Gandhi's understanding of nonviolence, which he derives from the Bhagavad Gita, that gives King an entirely new understanding of nonviolence, right? This is remarkable. King learns his mode and method principally from somebody, not from his nation and not from his religion, as a Baptist minister, and he is self-conscious about this. In other words, this is not a secret to him, right? He doesn't kind of bury this. In fact, and I'm gonna close with this, King goes to India a decade after Gandhi is martyred. King would, uh, would have the same fate a decade later. Okay, Gandhi is martyred in the late 1940s. King goes to India in 1959. He wants to see the legacy of the Mahatma, the great soul. Mahatma means great soul, right? Mahatma Gandhi, it's a title. Mahatma is a title. He wants to see the movement that Gandhi built. And the thing that stuns King is it's not a Hindu movement. It is an interfaith movement built by a Hindu. It involves Jains and Muslims and Sikhs and secular humanists, Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, who is the prime minister of India at the time and a disciple of Gandhi, is not a believer. He's not, he doesn't even really consider himself a Hindu. He considers himself culturally Hindu, if anything. Right? Gandhi has built this massive movement, this religiously diverse movement that frees the subcontinent from British colonial rule, largely nonviolently, based on his own Hindu religious conviction and inspiration, but inviting all of these other people in. So King is like witness to this, right? And he comes back to, uh, to Montgomery on Palm Sunday. He gives this sermon from the pulpit on Palm Sunday. What, Palm Sunday is three weeks away right now? About three weeks away. He, he gives a sermon on Gandhi on Palm Sunday in Montgomery. Just think about this, right? Montgomery, Alabama, I'm gonna say again, Alabama, <laughs> 1959, Palm Sunday, King is saying the most Christ-like person of the 20th century is a Hindu from India, okay? You want like a, a, a pink slip from the church board and you wanna be saying you want fries with your Coke a week later, you know, like give a sermon on, uh, the most Christ-like person you know being not a Christian. That's a good way, that's a good way to do it in a lot of churches. It shows how powerful King was at the time, at least in his, his own little community. The second to last line of King's sermon that day. You look this up. Martin Luther King Jr., Palm Sunday Sermon, 19, I think it's, it's either 1959 or 1957. Second to last line. Oh God, our gracious heavenly Father, we call you this name. We know, some, we know some call you Brahma. We know some call you Jehovah. We know some call you Elohim. We know some call you the unmoved mover, okay? So King has spent a month in India around all these people who call God different names, okay? And he is recognizing those people. We know some call you Allah. Here's the last line of King's sermon. Who will come to the front of the church stand by the altar and take Jesus into their hearts and lives as Lord and Savior today. Why do I end with those two lines? Because the first line that I quoted, right, the penultimate line of the sermon is a line that says, I respect and appreciate all of these different religious traditions. I will, I will, I will express that respect and, and appreciation by using the name of God that they use, Allah, Elohim, unmoved mover, Jehovah. What's the last line? I know who I am. I am a believing Christian, and I want you to be too. I can be both, is what King is saying. I can both respect, appreciate, love, cooperate with people from a, a range of different religions, King nominates one person for the Nobel Peace Prize, Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh. King marches arm in arm with Abraham Joshua Heschel and Selma, 
where he is going from Memphis on the day that he was killed was to celebrate Passover with Heschel, right? I respect, love, appreciate, learn from, cooperate with people from all these different religions. And I am really clear and strong in who I am. You can have roots and wings, right? I think that that's part of the beauty of interfaith cooperation, and it is a characteristic trait of so many of the interfaith leaders I know. All right, thanks everyone, question time.